we've been doing over the last few years, uh, me and other groups. Um, I'm going to start off by, well, I'm going to try to make this lecture quite pedagogical. So if you're an expert in these things, you might get bored. I apologize for that. But uh, you know, I'll try to give you some, teach you some how to, you know, some basic things about Trent Simons theory and edge theories of uh, systems described by Trent Simons theories, and then take you to some of the recent developments uh, that that are based on some of this stuff. So the first part of my lecture is going to be actually a lot of kind of old stuff from the 80s and 90s. So I'm going to start off by telling you about uh, some simple things about Trent Simons theory and uh, topological degeneracies that arise in systems described by Chern Simons theories. So, what we're going to focus on right now is the 1 over m Laughlin fractional quantum Hall states. So, these have been um, discussed quite a bit in this uh, over the last few days in the summer school. And when you want to think about 1 over m Laughlin fractional quantum Hall states, um, it's what I'm going to be focusing on is the effective field theory that describes the low energy physics of these fractional quantum Hall states. And that's described by what we call Chern Simons theory, which has the following Lagrangian. It's uh, m over 4 pi epsilon mu nu lambda. So A is a U1 gauge field. And capital A is the background electromagnetic field. It's the background EM field. So if you just take this action, uh, you can look at what the current is, for example. The current is J mu is delta L delta A mu. And that's 1 over 2 pi d mu a nu. Right. So oh, I also probably should mention mu runs over space and time. So t x mu runs over t x and y. And epsilon is just the anti-symmetric tensor here. Okay. So if you use this formula, you can pretty easily calculate from this Lagrangian that uh, you'll get a Hall conductivity of 1 over m. So that will be the, one of the first checks that this describes the, the, some of the basic physics of the 1 over m Laughlin state, which is that it has a Hall conductivity of 1 over m. Now, uh, you probably know that the 1 over m Laughlin state has quasi-particle excitations which carry fractional charge and fractional statistics. So how would we describe those quasi-particles in this effective theory? Well, we describe them um, using these Wilson, Wilson lines. So you, you can pick a path, C, which describes the world line of a quasi-particle. And the quasi-particle is labeled by some integer number, which is how much charge of this gauge field uh, it it carries. And so this Wilson line is e to the i l integral of a along this path. Now, these quasi-particles, which which, whose world lines are described by these operators, they carry charge l. And from the Chern-Simons term, you can easily see that uh, they're going to be bound to flux because the Chern Simons term binds charge to flux. And so uh, you know one charge will in this theory is going to be bound to 2 pi over m units of, of a flux. And the fact that quasiparticles in this theory are described by charge flux composites, you know, you have a charge here and a flux. That's why they have fractional statistics. Because if I take something with uh, charge and, and so the charge 1, say, and flux of 2 pi over m, charge 1, flux of 2 pi over m, when I take one around the other, I'm going to get a fractional phase. Uh, 
because of the Aronov-Bohm effect, because there's a fractional flux that each of them carries. OK, now in this theory, you can actually compute what the mutual statistics and the, of the quasi-particles are. If you take, say, uh, the following world line, so where this is quasi-particle with charge L and L prime, say, are going around this loop. And you compare this process to the process where they don't intersect. Then there's a phase. And this phase is 2 pi over m LL prime. So this is, this is the mutual statistics. And this is a, a kind of thing that you could imagine computing in this theory. You could take these, the Wilson line associated with these two curves and try to compute its expectation value and compute the expectation value for Wilson loops associated with these two loops. And you'll find a difference in phase here. There's also a, you can consider, a pro, if these were the same quasi-particle, you could just imagine that you, here there's two exchanges. You see there's, they're going around once and then another time over here. But if they're the same particle, they could, you could just consider them going around, uh, just exchanging once, something like this. And so this will give you the self-statistics of the particle. And if you compare this process to this process, then you get e to the 2 pi i theta l. Well, let's say e to the i theta l, where theta l is pi l squared over m. This is l. What okay. you mean by compute the expectation value? It takes this Wilson line. Yeah, so this is, you can think of this as some curve c and c prime. And then you can compute you know, w of c, c prime. Well, I'm not sure what the best way of writing this is, but imagining something, something like this. Oh. And this expectation Yeah, you could compute this exactly. You could compute this as a path integral in this action. Yeah. Now, to actually compute this is a, a subtle matter. There's all kinds of regularizations and so on that you need to work with. But it's something that you can actually, this is something that you can do. And how the left side with two loops intersecting and the right side with the sound intersecting differ in the actual Um Well, what's going to, if you actually do this calculation, what's going to wind up showing up is the linking number of the two links. Uh, not, I mean, I wouldn't actually need to go through the calculation. I mean, and I don't want to, I don't have time to do that. But if you just actually try to do it, yeah, it's not that bad. Okay. Now, in this theory, we have m topologically distinct quasi-particles. Right. Topologically distinct means that Two quasi-particles are topologically equivalent if they can be related to each other by local operators. And they're topologically distinct from each other if there's no local operator which can relate them. Now here, one way of, a simple way of seeing that there are m topologically distinct quasi-particles is um, the moment you put m quasi-particles together, then you have 2 pi flux. 2 pi flux is the same as having no flux. And so when anything goes around something with just an integer multiple of 2 pi flux, it's not going to pick up any phase. So another way of saying this is if one of these L's was equal to M, then we're not going to pick up any phase when we take a particle around it. So anything which is a multiple, any charge which is a multiple of M looks invisible to everything else. And so it's topologically trivial. Now, this Chern-Simons theory is, has a peculiar feature. Let's, let's look at the Hamiltonian for this theory. So to do that, let's, uh, let's do the following. Let's pick a gauge, at equals 0. 
But we can't just pick a t equals 0. We have to make sure that, well, actually, there's another way of saying it. Instead of just, in, let's just integrate out a t. Let me say it that way. a t enters in this Lagrangian or this path integral as a Lagrange multiplier. Then you get a constraint, which is that the flux needs to be equal to 0 everywhere. Right. Now, so let's. OK, so then we look at the Lagrangian now, and we have m over 4 pi a x a y dot. Okay. Let's look at the canonical momenta. So let's look at px, which is dl dAx dot. And we see that that's uh, minus m over 4 pi Ay. And then we look at Py. We see that's m over 4 pi Ax. And then we look at the Hamiltonian which, you know, it's px ax dot uh, plus py ay dot minus l. And you'll find that this is 0. The Hamiltonian of this system is 0. So is it, you might think it's completely trivial because we have a system whose Hamiltonian is 0. But it's not completely trivial because it has these operators in it and then the, the, these operators correspond to these flux composites that braid non-trivially with each other. Moreover, if we were to put the system on an uh, uh, interesting surface, so say a torus, we'll find, or any, in fact, any, any genus G surface, we'll find something peculiar. Yeah, yeah, it's another way of saying it. So let's put the system on a torus for now. Now, we can just work in the same thing I've done here, which is we, we, we don't have AT, we only have AX and AY, but the, we have to make sure that the flux is zero. So if the flux is zero, the only thing left to specify for AX and AY uh, is, basically how much flux is going through the whole of, these, of this torus. So we can write Ax as Lx and Ly are the, are the length of the torus in the two directions. So we can write Ax and, a, and Ay as uh, some coordinate x of t, and here it's some other coordinate y of t. And now if we look at the Lagrangian, which is the integral over space of so the Lagrangian density, then just plugging in, what you'll find is you have pi times m, um, well, let's write it a little differently, 2 pi m x y dot. So do you still have the fermions or you have to integrate it off the fermions? There are no fermions anywhere. Uh, this is just, the only thing I ever had was a chern simons gauge theory. So I had a U1 gauge field. And there's a churn simons term, and the coefficient was m. And I didn't have anything else in the Lagrangian. Yeah, so the particles you can treat as sort of external sources. Those are these, like, if you want to compute properties of quasi-particles, you just compute expectation values of these Wilson lines. But I never had any, I mean, the way that I've presented it, I don't have any, I didn't have any matter degrees of freedom that I integrated out. If you want to add dynamical quasi-particles, you would add matter in and let that matter fluctuate. But I haven't done that here. But yeah, that's what you would do. It depends what your goals are. Yeah. Right. Now, I wrote AX and AY like this, but there's an important thing, which is I have what are called lar large gauge transformations. 
So you know that under gauge transformation, A goes to A mu minus D mu F. So I can write F, F of X comma Y, say, as uh, 2 pi uh, X over LX. Or I can have 2 pi uh, Y over LY. These are, this is lowercase. Don't confuse this with this capital, the uppercase over here. So if I do these large gauge transformations, what you'll find is that capital X goes to capital X plus 1. Capital Y goes to capital Y plus 1. So X and Y are actually, they live on a, on a uh, periodic space themselves. They also live on a torus. Okay. So you look at this Lagrangian and, well, what you'll find is let's look at the, treat Y as a coordinate and look at the canonical momentum for Y. That's dl dy dot. That's 2 pi mx. So you can see that this Lagrangian has, is a system with one coordinate and one momentum. And it has this interesting feature that the, the volume of phase space is finite. So the, fa you know, the, the volume phase space here is py and, and y. And if you look at the volume of this space, well, x goes to x plus 1, y goes to y plus 1. So the volume of phase space is actually just 2 pi m. And when you quantize a theory, for every uh, 2 pi unit of phase space, you have one quantum state. So, that's, so that means that this directly tells you that there's m states in the Hilbert, st in the Hilbert space. If you do this on a genus G surface, then you, you, would, you would go through the same thing. But now, you know, you have something like this. You have di and through each hole of this genus G surface, you have to specify what the flux is. And a very similar calculation will tell you that you have m to the G states in general. Now, the way that I, I derive this topological degeneracy, it's a bit formal. There's a, a more physical way of understanding where, where this, why you had to have m states. And that's going back to these Wilson loop operators that I had introduced. If I'm on a torus, I can have a Wilson loop operator going around either this cycle of the torus or this cycle of the torus. So let me call this cycle alpha and this cycle beta. So I can define w of alpha. In integral over this loop alpha, or I can have w of beta. But now, plugging in this, uh, this decomposition over here, what you find is that w of alpha just becomes e to the i 2 pi x. Yeah, I think that's right. And W of beta is e to the i 2 pi y. And now, because x and y don't commute with each other, right, when we quantize, we have to say the momentum and the, and the coordinate are, you know, there's this commutation relation. That means that y comma x is i over 2 pi m. So if you look at the commutation relation for these Wilson loop operators, what you'll find is that W of alpha, W of beta, is W of beta, W of alpha, times e to the uh, x comma y times pi squared. But this phase is e to the 2 pi i over m. Okay. So what do we have right now? We have a system whose Hamiltonian is 0. So we have these operators, w alpha and w beta, which commute with the Hamiltonian trivially because the Hamiltonian is 0. But they satisfy this non-trivial algebra. And you know that if you have operators that commute with the Hamiltonian and satisfy some algebra, the quantum states need to form a representation of that algebra. 
But this algebra, the smallest representation of this algebra is m-dimensional. There's no way of having a, a representation which is smaller than m-dimensional. So the existence of these Wilson lines forces you into having m different states in the Hilbert space. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right. So in principle, the number of states has to be an integer multiple of m. OK. Now, so this alone won't tell you that there have to be exactly m states. By Occam's razor, that's the, the simplest number of states. But this other calculation directly told us that there were m states. So this is sort of a, what I would say a better and more physical way of understanding why there are m states. And just to tell you about the representation, so if you have that kind of algebra, you can pick n quantum states. n goes from 0 to m minus 1, where w of alpha on n is e to the 2 pi i n over m. And w of beta on n is n plus 1 modulo m. So this is the representation of this Wilson loop algebra that you could use, and it's very convenient. Okay. Now, in general, so, so far we've described just this, what, what it, we often call U1 level M churn simons theory, because there was a single U1 gauge field and its coefficient was M. In general, if we want to describe a more general class of, say, fractional quantum Hall states, uh, we could generalize this churn simons theory and have uh, more U1 gauge fields. So I could run from 1 to N. And then we would write a uh, more general version of this uh, churn simons theory, which is parameterized by a matrix now, K, A mu I, and uh, G. Um, oh, yeah, epsilon. So this K, it needs to be an integer symmetric matrix. Um, it needs to be symmetric because you can just integrate by parts here, and if it weren't symmetric, it would vanish. I mean, the anti-symmetric part would vanish. And it needs to be integer because if it wasn't integer, then when we try to go ahead and quantize it, we'll get a nonsense answer. So it has to be integer. And in fact, it's also true that if, the diag if any of the diagonals are, if all the diagonals are even, then this describes um, a state where the microscopic constituents of the system are bosonic. It's a bosonic, say, fractional quantum Hall state. If any of the KII are odd, then um, you're describing a state whose microscopic constituents contain fermions. Whatever, fermionic state. Okay. Now, in this more general theory, the, the number of ground states on a genus G surface is uh, the determinant of the K matrix to the Gth power. So this is on genus G. Um, now, let me go back here for a minute. You can see that the way that you get from one of the m ground states to another in this example was through these Wilson loop operators. That's what sort of shuffles you between the different ground states and the operators which can determine which ground state you're in. Physically, these Wilson loop operators, well, if we look at this picture, we can see what they correspond to. Physically, they correspond to a quasi-particle wrapping the cycle of the torus. So, the only processes which can distinguish these different ground states are processes where, say, a quasi-particle, a quasi-hole is created at some point, 
One of them is taken around the entire loop of the torus, and then they re-annihilate, or along the other loop. So because the only processes that can detect which state you're in are these non-local operators, the degeneracy is robust to any local perturbations of the system. You would need to have some non-local process which can distinguish and mix the different states into each other. That's why we call the degeneracy topological. And furthermore, it means that if the system were on a f were finite size, then there would always be some amplitude for this process to occur. But that process, would the amplitude for that to occur would be exponentially small. <laughs> and so there would be some exponentially small splitting between these ground states. Okay, now I want to discuss another thing, which is the uh, edge theory of, of systems described by a Chern-Simons theory. So if you were to put a fractional quantum Hall state on a system with a boundary, you would find that there's a chiral edge mode. And you know, this has come up in, in previous lectures where you can think of this chiral edge mode as the semi-classical skipping orbits of the electrons which are undergoing cyclotron motion. Now in this Chern-Simons theory, you can see that there has to be edge modes that are chiral as well. Let's go back to this theory. So if you were to do a gauge transformation, say take a mu to a mu minus d mu f, but you do it on a space with a boundary, what you'll find is that uh, the action is not invariant. The action will change. And it'll change by an amount, uh, well, you can see that. Uh, let me write the full thing. The change in the action is, is this. And so if the only boundary is at y equals 0, this is going to be f at y equals 0 times the integral over, uh, sorry. The y integral is probably over x or something, x and t. So the only way the action is going to be gauge invariant is if we demand that the gauge transformations go to 0 on the boundary. Okay? But if the gauge transformations go to 0 on the boundary, that means that the gauge field is actually a physical degree of freedom when it's on the boundary. So, so there's actually some physical degree of freedom which is propagating along the boundary. And we can understand that in the following way. Um, again, we integrate out a t. And we have this constraint that epsilon ij di aj is 0. In order to solve this constraint, what we can do is we can just set ai to be the gradient of some scalar field phi. You can see that this will easily satisfy this constraint. And if we do this and we plug back into the Lagrangian, what we'll find is um, you know, uh, well, I'll just write the answer. What you'll find is that uh, the action becomes minus m over 4 pi at y equals 0 dx phi dt phi. Now, this is, we didn't put any physics into here. We just sort of calculated from this. Yes? So if, if f is 0 at the boundary, why do you need to add the vector term? Because it's already taken there. No, no, we didn't add this extra term. I just solved the constraint, ai is di phi. I mean, I put in, I solved this constraint, which is that the flux is 0, by setting ai to be di phi. Okay. And then what I did was I went back to the original Lagrangian. And now the Lagrangian is the Lagrangian, not Lagrangian density. 
is pi m ax ay dot minus ay ax dot integral over d squared x. And then you plug in, just plug in that constraint here. So let me just. You have pi m integral dx phi dy phi dot minus dy sorry dy phi dx phi dot and if you um, hopefully if you integrate by parts these are the same thing. Unless I made a mistake here. Yeah, there we go. That's what I want to say. This is a total derivative. So, yeah. Anyway, you get the you you integrate to the boundary, and then you get what I had written before, which is uh, sorry. This is m over four pi. Sorry. I set f to 0 at the boundary. Yeah. So I set f to 0 at the boundary. That's why this phi is not pure gauge. Otherwise, phi would be pure gauge. So now phi can be physical. Right? If I just allow the gate, right, ai, I mean, if I'm allowed to do this transformation, a mu to, to a mu minus d mu f, then I could always change phi by to phi minus f everywhere. And so it wouldn't be physical at all. But the fact that f is restricted to be 0 at the boundary means that now phi is physical. There's a difference between phi and phi minus f. So the local u1 gauge symmetry, which the, in, the boundary, in the bulk, becomes a global physical u1 symmetry on the boundary. No, the flux has to be, this flux has to be zero because of the, because AT. We integrate out AT. Oh, okay. That tells us the flux has to be zero everywhere. Um, very good. Um, then, so what you'll, the way that you'll think about it is we derive this action for the edge theory. We, then we understand the edge theory. And then if, if you have a quasi-particle in the bulk now, then the edge theory has to be in a different sort of topological sector in order. Yeah, so another way of saying it is if I want to, suppose I start in the vacuum and I want to create I want to put a quasi-particle in a bulk. Well, one way of doing that is to put, to cre create a quasi-particle, quasi-whole pair in the bulk and take it all the way to the bound, take one of them all the way to the boundary. So now the way to think about this is I have a quasi-particle in the bulk, and then this the line from the Wilson loop, and then the quasi-particle goes to the boundary. And so if I want to add, so actually that was I was going to get to the quasi-particle operator in a second. Um, so let, let me come back to this in two minutes. So, so this edge theory that you get, S edge, it has minus m over 4 pi integral dx phi dt phi. Now, in general, there will there also be a, a term dx phi squared, which we didn't derive directly from the Chern Simons theory. There, you could derive it directly from a Chern Simons theory if you do this derivation a little bit differently, but it's better to just put in some physics into in, insight into this problem. So you have this mode, which is chiral. I'll explain why it's chiral in a second. There's some physical mode on the boundary. And this is just some sort of interaction term. Um, well, it doesn't look like an interaction here. But this is another term that you can add to the effective field theory on the boundary. And so you should add it in general. So that's there. And what this v is is going to depend, going to be set by some edge physics. 
the bulk physics can't tell you what V is. So it's something that you just need to add to your effective field theory. Yes? Well, instead of picking the gauge AT equals zero, you could have picked a different gauge, like AT plus VAX equals zero. And if you instead pick this gauge, then you will have a V term up there. So, but this isn't com totally physical. I mean, what, the way that you should think about it is just the Chern-Simons theory guarantees for you that there's some chiral mode on the boundary. And then exactly what its velocity is will just be set by some edge physics. It's not. The second term there is the unknown of the boundary phase. Yes. Um, because the, the gauge choice kind of becomes physical once it hits the boundary, because the gauge field is, uh, I mean, the gate, you lose the gauge symmetry at the boundary. But don't worry about this so much. I mean, this isn't, yeah. Okay, now the dense, the charge density in this theory is the gradient of phi. So that's something physical that you should know. I'm not going to derive it, um, but you could derive it. And this theory has the property that it's chiral, which you can see by just taking the, the Lagrangian and looking at the classical equations of motion. You'll find that the, the waves associated with phi only propagate in one direction. So it's a chiral theory. And now, importantly, if you were to quantize this theory and you look at the commutation relations for phi, what you'll find is that phi of x, uh, you'll, you'll, you can see here that the gradient of phi is like the canonical momentum for phi. That means that the gradient of phi with phi, um, y, is a delta function times i. Um, and the coefficient here is 2 pi over m, which is off by a factor of 2 from what you would naively deduce from this action. Um, and that factor of 2 is actually quite subtle. I'm not going to get into it. But this is, the, this is the commutation relations for this field. If you were to integrate the commutation relations, what you would find is that phi of x, phi of y, is equal to i pi over m times the sine of x minus y. And this is a very peculiar thing. It's telling you that the fields do not commute with themselves at different points in space. Okay, Same time, but different points in space, the fields don't commute with each other. And it's because of this property that suppose that you wanted to gap out this phi mode. Just get rid of it. Well, how do we get rid of uh, scalar fields, we would just try to add a mass term for it. Um, here, oh, one thing I didn't mention is that phi is equivalent to phi plus 2 pi. So it's also uh, it's compact, it's compactified. That follows from the properties of A on like large gauge transformations and things like that. So it, you, would, you would think naively, well, why don't I just add a cosine of phi term? Suppose I were, wanted to add a cosine of phi term to the Lagrangian. Naively, this would pin phi to the minimum of the cosine and then not let it move anymore. So if the coefficient were large, naively, I could get rid of this cosine. But actually, you, that can't happen. Physically, you know that that can't happen because this is a chiral edge mode. And a chiral edge mode can't disappear. A simple way of seeing that is I can add in a little bit of energy over here. And because the mode is chiral, that, um, that energy will start going in, in the direction of the chirality of the edge mode. And if I could get rid of the edge mode somewhere, then there's nowhere for the energy to go. So you, you can see the energy conservation proves to you that there's no way that you could ever get rid of this chiral edge mode. 
mathematically, the way that you can see why this cosine phi will never pin phi is because phi doesn't commute with itself at different points in space. So you can never set phi to, say, be you know, 0 everywhere. Because setting phi to 0 everywhere would not be consistent with this commutation relation that it doesn't commute with itself at different points in space. OK, so what are the quasi-particle operators in this theory? It's another important part of it. So remember that um, the quasi-particle operators in the bulk were described by these Wilson lines, e to the i l a over this loop c. This comes back to the question that was just asked. If I plug in this relation over here, let's look at the situation where we create a quasi-particle in the bulk, quasi-particle, say, quasi-whole pair in the bulk, and we take the quasi-particle all the way to the boundary, so say over here. Okay, so now we have this Wilson line from here to here, and that should be described by this operator. Now if I plug in, you know, say this is the y direction, if I plug in that expansion over there for ay, so this is just going to be ay dy then, we're just going straight up, this becomes e to the i l phi at this point on the boundary by x. Okay. So the quasi-particle operator, the operator that creates a quasi-particle in the edge theory is e to the i l phi of x. Then once you get to e to the i m phi of x, remember this was a trivial operator. Anything that once the charge l became an integer multiple of m, it's a trivial operator. So this operator, which is topologically trivial, you can identify with uh, the electron operator, say. This is the... If m, yeah, this, this would be in like the one-third Laughlin state, the electron operator would be given, the electron operator at the edge would be described by this operator. Okay. So this is the electron. And then these are the quasi-particles. Now, using... Using this formula for the charge density and these commutation relations, you can verify that adding this quasi-particle changes the charge by L over M. Okay, so in the one-third Laughlin state with L equals one, this is just creates something with one-third charge. And then you can verify that this operator changes the charge by one. So it, as promised, it corresponds to the electron operator. Okay. So now, now that we have set up the edge theory, we have some understanding for the edge theory, let's, uh, let's consider the following case now. Yep. Well, I decided to... Well, I wanted to... I was asking... Well, I was asking, what is the quasi-particle operator at this point? So that's described by this operator at the point x. So if I want to create the quasi-particle anywhere on, at, on the line x, coordinate with coordinate x, I would just change x over here. Well, this Wilson loop effectively creates a quasi-particle, quasi-whole pair and puts one of them at the boundary. Well, I, so I, okay, so I tried to sort of derive it, but here you can just, if you like, you can just take this operator, e to the i l phi of x, and you can see that if you look at the, how, you know, you can look at the charge density before or after you add this operator, and you can compare it with the charge density before you add this operator. Yeah. So 
you can compare these two and you'll find that the difference is L over M. So it creates a fractional charge L over M. Okay, so that so this discussion brings me to the next topic, which is suppose we did want to gap out the edge modes. So what we would do is we would say put two fractional quantum Hall fluids next to each other. So this is like the 1 over m Laughlin state, and this is the 1 over m Laughlin state next to it, and this is like a little piece of vacuum or insulator that separates the two. So now I now have these two edge modes going in opposite directions. So now in this situation you can add a backscattering term where electrons backscatter from this mode to this mode. So it's like minus t cosine of m phi l plus phi r. Now importantly, quasi-particles do not exist in the insulator. Quasi-particles cannot jump from one edge mode to another. Only electrons can jump from one edge mode to another. Another way of saying it is that quasi-particles are, are non-local operators. A quasi-particle operator here is a non-local operator. So I can't just apply a non-local operator here and then a non-local operator here. So if I have the vacuum here in these two edge states, I can't add a bare term, a cosine of phi L plus phi R. I can only add local terms, and so the coefficient had better be m, or some multiple of m, integer multiple of m. So now you can see that if you look at phi L plus phi R, phi L plus phi R at point x, you compare that with phi L plus phi R at point y, you look at this commutation relation, this is zero. So now the argument of the cosine does commute with itself everywhere in space. And so this cosine term can be successful in pinning its argument to a constant value in space. Okay. So if that happens, then what you do is you give an expectation value to this operator, phi L plus phi R, and you gap out the modes. So you, you gap out the modes. And then you give an expectation value to this operator. Physically, what does this correspond to? Well, e to the i phi l is like a quasi-particle on one side. And well, I've picked a certain normalization here. In this normalization, e to the i phi r is the quasi-hole on the other side. So this operator means that a quasi-particle, quasi-hole pairs on the two sides of this trench, these pairs have condensed. So this operator has acquired a non-zero expectation value. Okay, so this, we have a condensation of quasi-particle, quasi-hole pairs across this trench, and that has caused the edge modes to be gapped out. So this has a very interesting physical consequence to it, which is that now, suppose that a fractional quasi-particle were coming in from the bulk, and it comes to the edge. Well, there's a condensate at this edge. So this quasi-particle could come to the edge combine with this particle hole pair from the condensates. So it can annihilate with this hole and then leave behind the particle on the other side of this trench and then continue going. So you can see that this process glued the two fractional quantum Hall fluids together in a coherent manner so that now fractional quasi-particles can just coherently cross the trench. Okay, this is, Non-trivial thing because before, remember, quasi, before we gapped out these edge modes, quasi-particles could not traverse this trench. Only electrons could traverse this trench. So the fact that quasi-particles can now coherently go across this trench is a very non-trivial thing that has occurred, which has only occurred because we managed to condense these quasi-particle quasi-hole pairs across the trench. So this is kind of interesting now, because if you look at the minimum, this cosine, this cosine actually has m different minima. So this expectation value is actually equal to e to the 2 pi i n over m, where n is one of the n different, is one of the different minima of this cosine term. So n goes from 0 to m minus 1. So, so let's consider the following situation now. Suppose that we started on a torus, but where the, the there was a whole, you know, part of the torus was cut out. Okay? 
And now we have these edge modes, one going like this and one going like this. And then we glue the, the torus back together. When we glue the torus back together, you see that we, you, you know, we have this cosine term. There are n different minima for the cosine term. And you can see now that there are actually m different states. m states. Once you gap out the edge modes with this cosine term, we have m different states that you get corresponding to the different minima of this cosine term. What has this told us? Well, this is another way of viewing that topological degeneracy of m that I derived for you within Chern-Simons theory half an hour ago. Why, how can you see that it's topological? Here it just looks like it's different minima of the cosine. It looks very trivial. Well, the only operator which can distinguish which of these different minima you're in is this quasi-particle operator, right? This quasi-particle, quasi-hole operator which goes across this trench. So this is, by itself, this is a non-local operator. So, and in fact, that, that kind of represents a piece of this Wilson line which is crossing this cut over here. So really, you're, you're deriving from the edge point of view the fact that there are m states and also the fact that the only way of distinguishing the different m states is from these Wilson line operators which go all the way around the torus. Yes? That's a great question. So then, at that point, you need to start being careful about what you're doing because naively, you would have gotten m squared states. But you have to be careful because the eigenvalue of this operator better match the eigenvalue of this operator. So you can't be dumb and forget the fact that this is actually two sides of the same torus. So you do need to be careful about the global topological considerations. But if, as long as you're careful, you can rederive all of these degeneracies from these edge, ed, edge points of view. Yeah. Well, it does care about the length in this direction, because if you wanted to properly analyze this co this edge theory, well, you have different minima of the cosine. But then there could be instanton events where the system tunnels from one minima of the cosine to the other minima of the cosine term. So if you wanted to properly include that in the edge theory, that would lead you to an effective theory which also includes a term you know, which is exponentially suppressed, e to the minus the length in this direction divided by uh, some correlation length times, um, you know, Something like, well, it's whatever the it's the operator which sort of changes you, shuffles you from one minima to the other. So if you were going to properly analyze this edge theory, first you would conclude that there's m different minima, but then you would have to include fluctuations of the phi field, which will include instanton events, which can which can cause mixing between the different minima. And then once you include those instanton events into the effective action, then you'll have terms that can connect the different minima, but they're exponentially suppressed in the length of the edge. Okay, now, OK, you're asking about this one? OK, so this one isn't included in the edge theory. Yeah. Edge theory only has so much information in it. Yeah. Which two are not the same then? Ah, very good. If this was m prime and this was m, then the only things that you could add here are cosine of some integer times m plus another integer times m prime. And then you would have to look at the commutation relations and see if uh, n1m plus n2m prime and n1m plus n2m prime was 0. And if it was 0, then you can pin the, co the argument of the cosine. You can gap out the modes. If it's not 0, then you can't do that. They're completely robust. <laughs>
Yes. 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 Right, if M and M prime, yeah, you guys are asking very good questions. Uh, if, and in fact, these are parts of my talk that I wouldn't have explained. So if M and M prime are different, then what you have is some kind of uh, interesting situation where um, suppose that you were on a torus and like this half is M and this half is M prime. Okay, now, but you've gapped out these edge modes. And so what happens when you gap out edge modes? Well, there's some quasi-particles which can coherently traverse the, the, the bound, that boundary. But in general, some quasi-particles are going to be able to traverse the boundary, and some are going to be stuck at the boundary. They cannot go further. So, so there's going to be some Wilson lines which you can, can go all the way through this boundary now. Because the associated quasi-particle, quasi-hole pair is condensed at that edge. And then there are going to be other Wilson lines where they, you can't complete it. They're just stuck at the boundary. So in order, then you can ask, well, what's the degeneracy? Well, then you would, do, you would figure out all the Wilson loops which can close in this direction, and then all the ones which can close in this direction. You would look at their algebra, and then you would see what the smallest irreducible representation of that algebra is. Okay, and in fact, I'm going to do a version of this over the next hour in some other special cases. But that's the basic point. Yeah. Um, how much do I have more time? Or? Um, okay. <laughs> Actually, this is a good place to stop, so. Okay.